Welcome to Eternal Journey, the podcast. What is up, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of Eternal Journey, the podcast that talks about all things eternal with a focus on limited play. I'm your host, Jedi, aka Caesar the Crowd Pleaser. And uh, this week for episode 21, we're going to be discussing an interesting topic, which is who's the beatdown. That's right, we'll go into it a little more in depth in a moment, but uh, two little snippets. First, I want to go ahead and, with a shameless plug, put in the our YouTube channel, which is EJ the Podcast on YouTube. That's right. That's where you can find the video version of this podcast, as well as all kinds of fantastic and less than fantastic <laughs> content, depending on how you view it. I put a lot of draft videos up there. I also do uh, forge videos, sealed videos, as well as uh, uh, the occasional event. Every special event that goes up, I do those events and post them on there for you guys to see if you want to do them or not. So definitely check that out when you can't catch me streaming live at twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ, where you can catch me streaming live every Monday, Tuesday, and Saturday mornings. We once again primarily focus on limited play, but I do some constructed as well. So before we go into our pack one pick one, I do want to go ahead and take the time to mention this because I thought it was quite funny. So <clears throat> I have a really interesting intuition and I say interesting because some might say it's good. Some might say it's bad. Uh, I'm kind of still trying to figure out that myself. Uh, for example, uh, one would say that, uh, you know, I have the intuition of playing around uh, certain combat tricks which obviously is great and limited the problem is is and my intuition smells it out like i smell a combat trick here or a removal spell and i'm occasionally the majority of the time correct the only issue is that i'm always wrong on which one it is i'm always like oh i'm gonna play around a daring maneuver here and it ends up being like i don't know like spiteful strike or something you know what i mean and things like that so i ends up i try to play around it and i play incorrectly um but the other things that come up which i'm gonna go ahead and say these two things because i'm just gonna assume that half the people that listen to this podcast also listen to mtg content magic the gathering and first i want to go ahead and mention that this episode was actually going to be a how to deal with tilting or the tilt uh aspect of limited and tournament play because i think it's quite important and for those of you that have watched me stream realize that that is part of my streaming experience as well uh, i like to think i handle it pretty well but you know i still let it know it's there because after all that's what you guys are doing and uh watching and stuff so why not and so that was what this episode was going to be and i had made this decision a little bit ahead of time and you know drew out the show notes and then limited resources pops out their latest uh episode and what do you know in the title it says tilt i'm like you've got to be kidding me so because of the fact that like i said i'm going to go under the assumption that half the people that listen to this podcast also listen and uh consume mtg content i don't want to reiterate something that was just brought up so i decided to audible into a different topic which is who's the beat down now another little segue now this is a segue this is a tangent but i think it's funny so another interesting thing a few years ago, uh, probably a lot more than a few years ago now that I think about it, I wanted to design my own magic set for limited purposes. Like it was going to be focused on limited play, right? And one of the, so I was trying to think of themes, trying to think of themes. And then the third theme that I came up with, which I ended up liking that we had not seen in magic yet was an Egyptian theme, right? And so I was like, that sounds great. That sounds super neat. We haven't done anything like that since, you know, Arabian Nights and stuff like that. So I came up with, I started to put together this world and I had a tricolor mechanic, which I won't go into, um, but this is what I thought was humorous. So mind you, this was a side project. So I didn't spend too much time on it, like devoted, like guaranteed, like every week I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, right? So one of the ways I was playing around was I wanted there to be a green black faction, which obviously played around the graveyard. And so trying to make a new mechanic that didn't kind of mimic some of the things that were around, uh, I want to say it might've been Innistrad was around. Cause I, I think I, I came up with a variation of, what was that mechanic where you could sack 
a unit to to discount the card. Anyways, long story short, I tried all kinds of new Gary Vart mechanics, and the one I ended up coming up with, which I was gonna solidify, was Mummify. And Mummify simply was where you have Mummify X, right? And X could be any casting cost. I d I choose. And what it would do is a unit with or a unit or a creature with mummify when it died and once it was in your graveyard once it was in your graveyard you could cast it from your graveyard or i'm sorry you could pay the mummify cost and it would put a 2-2 zombie or it would yeah a 2-2 zombie into play with all the rules text that that unit had so the main idea of this was that it would um it would be less about the body and more about the enter the battlefield effect that that unit will have or the occasional static effect you know what i mean so like you know one of them was uh that i had designed was you know your opponent or no one can gain life while this guy's in play another one was is at the common level was give a plus one plus one counter and all the way up to kill a unit you know what i mean and so it was one of those things where you know you could have a five five and then it died and then when it came back like for example if it was five five draw you a card and it died and then you mummify it it just creates a two two mummy which was a zombie token that's why i i had it just kind of simplify the whole token aspect because it was like well you know how are we gonna do it like i don't want a million tokens so let's just make it to where they're all just two two zombies that seems fair and kind of flavorful because it's a zombie uh, but it could still be a mummy and then you just get the enter the battlefield effect so once again let's go back to our five five sphinx when you play it you draw a card right when it dies you mummify it for xyz i didn't pick up casting cost or whatever it would come back into play as a two two flying zombie and, and you draw a card you know and it's and so that's how i did it and i was pretty happy about this mechanic and so to my mass disappointment and excitement and who knows everything else i think about a year later is when Amonkhet, or maybe two years, I'm not sure. Like I said, my timetable is a little rough, but Amonkhet gets announced and released, and then they have Embalm, which is so similar to what I was talking about. And then, of course, they ran into the zombie or token issue where you have to make like a billion tokens because you have everything with Embalm. So, yeah, I just... Uh, it was it was a good feeling at the fact that I was on the right track, but then a bad feeling because then I kind of lost the originality to my mechanic, which was a little bit of a bummer, but such is life i think it was kind of fun uh i think i'd even came up with a triple strike mechanic i'm not really sure i don't remember now like that one's a little vague but then the unset came out and it had like slow strike or slow combat or, or last combat or something like that so it effectively made triple strike or maybe i think a goblin even had triple strike anyways i was playing around with a bunch of mechanics i think i came out with I think I had a mechanic for all five factions that I made in the set. I, they just weren't hashed out. Like, it wasn't played out, so I didn't know if that was going to be their final version or not. But that's my little tangent. Hope you guys kind of enjoy that little snippet of information. I thought it was kind of humorous. Uh, needless to say, that kind of took a little bit of the wind out of my sails for doing the mechanic. And then other things happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, or finishing the set, rather. So, if you are going to ask, I did not finish the set, sadly. I will say that a lot of time went into just formalizing the general scheme maneuver as far as like, okay, how many comments, how many uncommons, how many units, how many spells, how many artifacts, how many uh, multicolor factions, et cetera, et cetera, was initial part of the heavy thing. And then I was just kind of creating any unit or spell that came to mind. I just wrote it down and figured I'd tweak it later on. Uh, I came up with another spell mechanic that I was super happy with. I don't remember what it was now. I have to look at my notes to see. I might share it with you guys in the next episode. We'll see. Let me know in the comments uh, below if you are interested in finding out more as a side project of the set I was trying to design. I know I'm very much not the original. There's plenty of that in a cube, one of the cube websites where people post up their common cubes. A lot of people have the sets they made up there. And I think there's another website that has people that have made sets. I tried purposely not to go to those sets. Uh, what sparked this for me further going down the tangent is the uh i don't know if any of you that play mtg but somebody made a star wars draft set and it was actually quite good it got a lot of reviews they did all the artwork they did the balancing and stuff and people liked it quite a bit so if you can google that try to check it out you can actually print out the full version sleeve it up and play it i have not done that but i would like to one day okay all right guys that's gonna do it for our tangent 
quite a bit i'm glad you're still with me hope you're still with me and enjoyed that little snippet like i said if you didn't let me know in the comments below if you did let me know as well so i know how to continue to steer the show so let's go into our pack one pick one all right uh we're starting to get kind of late in the format even though we did get some balance changes so i'm not gonna spend too much time going through each individual card uh, but you know i will go into some of our discussion points so starting off with our comments we have outdraw which is the deal four damage to an enemy unit at slow speed and uh for six in red and onslaught you get four power so effectively if it, you do it post combat it only costs two we have retribution which is the awesome slow spell for three green silence and stun an enemy unit and then if you have onslaught triggered it kills it after that we have the auric lookout the two three shift two with endurance and scout we have Muck Crawler, the 1-1 one, one, that if you have a shifted unit, it becomes a 3-3. Three, three. Murderous Flock, the 4-3 four, for 4 and a blue. And when you scout, it has flying for the turn. Phase out, choose a unit and shift it. Arcanum Elite, the 1-1 one, one flyer with Onslaught, you get a, one of you and one of your other units gets a plus one to or plus two to health. Heist, yeah, we're not even gonna go over that. Uh, the, and out of all these, ironically i like both the green ones a retribution and auric lookout are both extremely powerful i like auric lookout because it cleans out your draws the two three body is extremely well positioned in this format and the fact that it has endurance means it does quite a bit of work if you're able to pump it in any form or fashion but uh between the two they're in the same faction uh retribution is just absolutely amazing i like it in offense you can trigger it uh you can use it without um onslaught obviously to get a pesky blocker out of the way and get in there or if you just absolutely have to silence something or kill you uh, but if not then nine out of ten times it's going to be a fantastic removal spell taking something out of the game completely because it silences it before it kills it so it takes uh you know umbran uh or dark uh, what is it the flying tutu umbran that i like so much or dark return shenanigans out uh going into the uncommons we have shield crafter the two six tinker for five green onslaught you gain six armor which is not bad it's not bad it's not great but it's not bad we have wretch talon the three three relic weapon for five shadow shadow onslaught play a one one spider with deadly i like this card quite a bit and then combustion brawler the six four overwhelm elemental for five red red and when the enemy uh the enemy player can't gain life so you can still gain life just not them and shift four exhaust an enemy unit so all these are great honestly they all have a good slot in the deck i uh, like wretch town i think shield crafter is the weakest out of the three of these um it is good but it's just good at coming up the board and giving you some life it doesn't really help you win uh, i guess if you slap a decent sized relic weapon on it then you can get in an easy two for one probably even a three for one uh and like i said it is a roadblock the six health is definitely a lot um moving on though i think it's between brawler and talon and out of the two i think brawler in the end will win more games than wretch talon so i think brawler takes the uh the higher slot here that being said i do think it's quite close for retribution and combustion brawler so let's go into our rare our rare is kira the prodigy which is the 2-2 two -two unseen for two green uh when kira gets pl pl added attack or health or battle skills for the turn she keeps them so this is the uh streamer created card uh, yoda bite made this card i've mentioned that quite a few times on the show but i like to do credit where credit's due i think he did a great job of making it uh so long story short if you for example um pummel kira then she will remain a 4-4 four four. uh she does also keep the battle skills so for example if you are able to do like the plus two plus two and flying and stun a unit until end of turn or something like that i forgot that combat trick uh, she will keep the plus two plus two as well as flying they do stack so if you like, you know, I don't know, like give her a spiteful strike. There you go. Plus one, plus two, life steal and first strike. She will keep that. And then later on you pump her again. She will keep both bonuses. So that is a phenomenal two drop. Uh, the bottom end of it, it is a two drop nonetheless. Um, I think this card is fine, but first picking her is kind of tough because at the end of the day, if you don't have combat tricks and things to pump her with, at the end of the day, she is still just a two, two for two, which I think is pretty medium so i think it goes back to combustion brawler and retribution which both are very powerful cards and uh do a lot of work 
Uh, I feel like both can help you win the game because Retribution gets a unit out of the way that might kill you or also just gets a unit out of the way on offense. Combustion Drip Brawler does that for a turn, also stops your opponent from gaining health. And, I mean, let's just face it, 6-4 Overwhelm is a pretty legit body as well in the color faction that has Overwhelming or out, uh, Daring Maneuver as well as Pummel. But... I think for me, I am going to end up first picking Retribution. Reason being is removal still kind of has a bit of priority for me over uh, units, especially a five drop, which is somewhat replaceable, even though this one is an uncommon. But the other deciding factor is that Combustion Brawler is double red versus Retribution being solo justice or solo green. So it is if we are do decide to go three colors and splash, we're more likely to splash Retribution or play Retribution than we are Combustion Brawler. And I'm always prepared to kind of throw away my first pick. So I decided to go with Retribution here, but I would not fault you for taking, I think, Kira negates Auric Lookout. But so I think... Uh, combustion brawler and then wretch talent is good but i don't think it's strong enough to go double shadow on our first pick Alrighty, guys that is our pack one pick one so with that let's go into our main topic for episode 21 which is who's the beat down so what does the beat down mean in limited there is typically a give and take or long story short who's the beat down the counter pack to that who is on defense who's the control player right who's the beat down who's the control player and so what this signifies me is is that one typically and this can change back and forth and that's why it's important to ask the question who is the beat down and the beat down is the aggressor the person that is turning their unit sideways and trying to get in there to kill their other uh the opponent and the counter side to this is the control player or the defensive player, which is trying to stay alive and stop the aggressor. And the reason why this warrants its own topic is because of the fact that it changes multiple times throughout the game, typically. Granted, there are times where you can just steamroll your opponent or your opponent steamrolls you and thus they are the beat down the entire time. But that may not always be the case. And so it is very important to know when to switch gears or turn the corner, as some of you have heard me say and other announcers on uh, stream and stuff like that say. Uh, I am not 100% sure where turning the corner stems from. I probably should look it up. My interpretation of it is from the running aspect of it, like in races, typically a uh, small quick tangent. For me, typically in races back when I was racing, you would look for blind corners. And uh, what this means is, is a corner you don't see the other side of it until you get there. And if you're ahead of a runner and you see a blind corner and you turn the corner, it's typically when you speed up or do a burst of speed to pull away from the person behind you. That way they don't see you speeding up. They think you're going the same pace. They maintain their same space pace. And then when they turn the corner, it turns out that you are much further ahead of them than they anticipated, which could be a bit of a mind game with them as well as just enough to put your head because now they have to speed up when they weren't anticipating it so that's my interpretation of what turn the corner means just wanted to go real quick and discuss it if you think it means something else by all means let me know i'm very interested to find out or where it stemmed from but so what this means is there is a chance that you could be on the defensive be the control player and then all of a sudden you've stabilized your opponent is starting to get low on cards and now you can become the beat down and start to win the game uh, so that's what the beatdown means and why we're discussing it today uh, some of you might have experienced this already both in the positive and negative where you're losing you're losing now all of a sudden you're like wait i can start attacking or vice versa where you're the aggressor you're steamrolling your opponent in the early stages of the game and then all of a sudden they've managed to build a board and stabilize and then you have no way of getting through more damage so there's a couple of things that play a role in this and those are the factors we are about to discuss the first factor that will play a role into whether you are the beat down or the control for any given game is what is your deck trying to do so this is something that you can figure out pretty early and honestly is a part of deck building but it goes a long way towards playing out your games like your opening hands and things like that what this means is is your deck a control deck is your deck a aggressive deck uh so control you're trying to make it to the late game 
your early game plays are literally just trying to slow the game down so you can get to your bigger haymakers at the top end of your curve uh is your deck an aggressive deck are you do you have a low power curve are you hoping to get a bunch of units out early and overpower your your opponent with combat tricks and small removal and stuff like that to get through you know things like daring maneuver pummel and suffocate or are you a mid-range deck which most limited decks fall into this kind of archetype where they have a little bit of aggression they have but they have a curve that goes all, all the way up to your bigger units so depending on how the game plays you have plays throughout the entire game or is your deck more of a build around card so is there some kind of uncommon that you took uh for example the uh i think it's ancient clock tower that really wants your deck to be warping in spells like is that the card that makes your deck work and does it not really work unless you get there things like that all these things kind of help you decide on what your game plan is so for example if you are the control deck right then you know right off the bat you are not going to be the beat down until you make it to the late game and it's going to be obvious to you when it's time for you to become the beat down uh, this also means that you you acknowledge the fact that early game you're going to be the control player and this goes a long way uh, towards helping you evaluate opening hands and things like that as well as what to do in the early stages of games when do you trade when do you not what gives you the most longevity in the game uh, for aggressive decks it is the complete opposite knowing that you are an aggressive deck your goal is to try to get underneath your opponent's strategies so you want to look for hands that are aggressive you want to make plays that are aggressive and essentially put as much pressure on your opponent as possible for them to main to remain the control player and not stabilize uh, this also lets you know that you know if it comes to a point where the opponent stabilizes or they're starting to then you have to evaluate whether you can still win from that position or not which we'll discuss about later uh, mid-range you know um that one kind of base, you're based around your hand and what your opponent's doing this one is kind of a little more flexible because you can go either way and then finally the build around the build around kind of falls close into the control deck where you know what kind of combo centric synergy things you're trying to do and so whether you can make that happen or not dictates on whether you're going to be the beatdown or not because typically if you're not doing what your deck is designed to do then you're losing and so you're the control player uh, and vice versa if it is doing what you want it to do then you are typically going to be the beat down and hope to get your opponent dead so that's what your deck is trying to do the second uh, factor that i like to mention is what phase of the game are you in this also comes into play because it will discuss you know how much how many resource how much resources you have to use how much power how many cards in your hand all this stuff so let's go into it in a little more detail which we had talked about in a previous episode which is the quadrant theory so we have development this is the early stages of the game where you're trying to play your power on curve so one two three four five six maybe uh you know so during the development phase some of the things that will dictate on whether you're the beat down or first or not is if your opponent is trying to be aggressive right you want to you want to take into account you are not gold fishing you're not playing solitaire you are working against a live human being that has an, a strategy of themselves so you have to look and sometimes even if you do have an aggressive start if you are on the draw and your opponent is on the play and they have an aggressive start as well then you are effectively the control player because you are always going to be one turn behind until you make it happen so for example let's just go basic neither of you do anything on turn one then you both do something on turn two and you both do turn something on turn three right well now it's turn four your opponent has the ability to use a combat trick to kill one of your guys and get him more damage they've already attacked you first um and so they can kind of steamroll value on so it is better for you like for example if you try to play a unit and they kill it well now you have to either decide on whether you want to sacrifice tempo and kill their unit which mind you their unit already got in for damage and then they have the first chance of playing another unit or if you want to play a unit to try to develop your board some more and give them the opportunity to kill your unit uh again you know what i mean um it's a little more difficult to describe without detail but things like that like tempo <clears throat> could make a difference on whether you are the beat down or not as well as the simple are you on the board first like if you have a two drop and your opponent keeps a shaky hand or they mill down to six or they're a control player and they don't have a two drop 
Well, shoot, if you got nothing else to do, then swing, you know, and then maybe they play a one three on the next turn and you have two two twos while well, you swing again. You know, trading four damage for one or, or two damage for one seems good to you. So you are the beat down and you want to get in that early damage until something tells you not to. Uh, and then obviously the flip, like I just had mentioned, if they're on the board first and they're more aggressive, even if you do have a more aggressive start, you have to consider your options to maximize your gameplay. And then you're the control player until you're able to turn that corner. Um, next is when you are behind, right? When you're behind is never a fun place to be in, but that is extremely important to figure out when you are uh, supposed to uh, be the aggressor or not right because sometimes it's your only out sometimes you're behind they have a better board than you but you realize like hey i have no way of killing that unit so i just gotta you know bash them back and see what happens or you know maybe they have a bunch of evasive units like an unblockable that you can't deal with so you have to get aggressive to force them to make blocks and stuff like that uh what are your outs you know what i mean if you if you holding back all your units helps you to develop a better board so you can attack profitably then you know you are playing the control player and holding back your units and trying to make profitable blocks and things like that or de-incentivize your opponent from being aggressive and switching gears and so it's really important when you're behind to really kind of play to your outs you see a lot of experienced players say that where you may take a less than optimal play for what is in your hand or what you're looking at on the board right now but it will set you up for success later on if you draw the cards that will help you get out of this this is one of the things that really nuts you level up in your gameplay when you are able to like all right this xyz killing this or blocking this or attacking here looks really bad right now but if it sets up you know another play later on then that that will help you win the game then it seems to be the better play than whatever else you might have thought was the correct line so being behind is definitely really important to know whether you should be beating down or you can wait and be the control player next up we have parity this one is a little bit harder to decide on and this is what mainly you're looking for what will break the parity right so parity means that there's a stalled board state like you and your opponent either have nothing on board or you have no good attacks or there's just it's such a complicated board state that neither of you could attack to each other profitably and things like that and so here you really 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 want to know whether you're going to be supposed to be the beat down or not uh, because if you make an attack too early you could potentially lose your board or give your opponent a huge advantage because they're able to select blocks in a way that will profit them the most uh, vice versa if you have the stronger board presence and then your opponent and you're just holding back because you don't want to lose any of your units there might be a chance that you are going to give your opponent the opportunity to build a better board and then become the stronger board out of the two so you would want to attack there even if you are going to lose a unit or two because you have the stronger board state and make their blocks though profitable not as profitable as they would like it to be and then you maintain your control of the board so parity can be one of the more difficult ones to assess because no one wants to kind of flinch first but sometimes it does especially with you have you know a combat trick or two in your hand that could change combat math in a way they don't expect uh, hand size matters which we'll go about later on in this topic <clears throat> and finally we have when you're ahead believe it or not being ahead is also a strong position to uh or very valuable to understand whether you are the beat town the beat down or the control player the reason why i say this is there are times where you are ahead you're smashing your opponent and you have to decide when they start to kind of develop a board state if it is worth you making a couple of uh not so great attacks to continue to press the advantage and get in damage that is something that aggro players have to learn early on in their careers is when to continue attacking and when to stop because there are times where trading you know your best unit your three three to get in six points of damage from you know three two twos is valuable because they you know you're trading one unit for six damage and that might bring your opponent down to four and so it's harder for them to you know come back from there or it might be in a position where you're losing two units to get in two extra damage and that just doesn't seem profitable enough for you to attack so you have to be able to identify there 
that you have now switched to the control player and you are no longer the beat down until you are able to swing the attacks back into your favor. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the opponent's gonna attack you, but it does mean that you're no longer beating down or you might be but you have to stall the board state for a turn to like i said better develop your board like drop a larger unit or maybe make sure you play enough to have that removal spell etc etc uh when you're ahead it is more about uh, if you've heard this, good players mention this or announcers, where it is not so much about how do I win this game, but more about how do I not lose this game. So when you're so far ahead uh, that, you know, it's just a matter of like, okay, if I keep this game plan, follow this line, I will win. So now you have to switch gears a little bit, just a little bit. You're going to stick to that game plan, but you have to start looking at ways like what can my opponent do or how can I mess this up to lose the game instead? Because if not, and everything continues to go the way it's going, I'm going to win this game. So it's a little bit of an odd concept, but it is something you have to consider because it does cause you to play a little differently sometimes. But other than that, yep, those are the four phases of a game and why and how each one can potentially affect whether you are the beatdown or not. And enough of you have played limited, I would like to think, to realize that or know that at least 40% of your games, and I don't think I'm exaggerating this number, I think it's actually there, maybe even a little bit higher, are typically decided by one turn. One set of plays in a single turn based on whether where you know your decks are can easily dictate a a can easily dictate the outcome of the game for example your opponent has a really beefed out unit with an attachment on it and some stuff and things like that and you know you have no removal spell in your deck to take it out right or you might have it but you don't know where it is in your deck so your opponent attacks and let's say their unit's only going to put you on a two turn clock right so you have to block and you have to block non-profitably like double or triple block to lose all your units but you're able to get their guy off the board right so in this one turn two things can happen either the triple block was correct and you lose two units or all three of your units but that your opponent's behemoth is off the board or they have the combat trick that allows them the three for one you and now you have an empty board state and they're eight, they still have their monster of unit that could just swing and you might either have no answers left in your deck or you know you have to draw that one eviscerate uh so and that's happened to all of us and that's that's the type of thing that uh can be decided and why it's so important to know when you're the beat down or not and why little key entry interactions like that could potentially cost you a game or make you the game cost your opponent the game moving right along the third factor that could influence on whether you are the beatdown or not is what does your hand look like for that matter what does your opponent's hand look like what i mean is like on the surface level how many cards are in your hand is it late game are you both top decking does your opponent have one card in hand or do they have four cards in hand these small little snippets or data points can affect what you do for example, if we go back to that aggressive stance where you have a bunch, a wide board, right? You went wide with your board, even though none of your units are that impressive. Or maybe you are in a, let's do that. Let's do a racing situation, right? You are racing your opponent and you have a unit in hand, but no combat tricks, nothing else that changes the clock, right? Do you continue to race your opponent if it's close? Like you are ahead by one turn because you were on the play or you attacked early, but it's very close. There's maybe a three point life just swing, right? what if you have nothing but another unit and a sigil in your hand and your opponent has four cards uh they might be it might be correct to attack it might be uh the better play to then become the uh control deck the reason being is four cards is a lot they can have something that for example if they're in shadow they can have ways of giving their one of their units lifesteal and extremely changing the clock where you thought you might win by a turn now all of a sudden you're behind by a turn they might have a removal spell to get rid of your biggest unit uh, things like that come into play and so you have to take that in consideration uh, the flip side to that is same thing if your opponent is top decking and they haven't done anything for two turns or they're one of those players that just play every sigil as they draw them so they have nothing in hand or they haven't killed any units in three turns you know now that their hand is pretty much empty unless they have a very narrow card in it 
because they would play any of their units. So you are free to continue to swing in as long as you have a commanding board presence. Little things like that can decide on whether you are the beatdown or not. Then actually what is in your hand uh, can make a difference as well, especially in like the development phase. Do you have one unit in hand and that's all you have to take you into the late, mid and late game in the development? So you have to conserve that unit, you can't throw it away. Do you have a, you know, much, the same thing like a slow hand where you have like one small unit or a one four and you have like a removal spell and then everything else is like fly drops, like a slow hand like that. Or maybe some, you take a turn off to ramp things like that or the flip side is is your hand aggressive do you have one drop two drop three drop plus like cheap combat trick backup you know if that's the case and that tells you that you're going to be the aggressor you know play your corrupted crooked alley guide then play your duelist and then play your you know uh uh dervish and then have the pummel backup or play a blurry chaser with pummel backup on three things like that can dictate on whether you're going to be the beat down or not and I think that is quite a big, big decider, really. Um, go back to that situation where we talked about where they had one big unit that could block any one of your guys and you have a board say of five guys, do you swing? Well, if you have a combat trick that allows the one unit they block to survive combat and potentially kill theirs, then yeah, that's 100% you swing. If you don't, it's like, okay, well, will this combat trick, if I play it on one of my units that doesn't get blocked, is it enough to kill my opponent? Or can I stun their unit to get in there? All these things come into play and can help on a turn-by-turn -turn basis decide on whether you are to be the beatdown or not. And like I said, it really can turn on... Uh, it could change back and forth in one turn. Like you could be the control deck and then all of a sudden you top deck a removal spell and now you are the aggressor and then you attack, you get their unit out of the way, you attack and then they play a, you know, a ambush unit or they have a removal spell or something. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh no, now, you know, you're back on defense. Uh, vice versa, you can draw a card that let's say your board is kind of medium or a parody with your opponent. And then all of a sudden you're both you know taking swings at each other and then you draw like a card your most powerful legendary that can win you the game but you have to get to that legendary you're still two turns away well then now you decide that you're gonna you know uh bunker up and settle down and become the control deck to make sure you can get to that legendary and all that matters with what is in your hand you know are you able to do stuff are you able to hunker down uh or do you have to stay aggressive things like that is the third factor moving right along to the fourth one which is what does the board state look like so i've kind of touched on that a couple of times but this comes into play uh, you have to look and see for example like let's say you have the stronger board right you have your your encombre and you have you know all these huge units on your side and your opponent has a bunch of rinky, rinky dink units but they have two deadly units well those deadly units are going to trade up with your big guys right yeah, so that does mean that you sh probably shouldn't attack with your biggest guys. But there, once again, there are some things that come into play. Are they are those their only units? Are they uh, do your units have overwhelm? Because for example, let's just say you have the Stiggy, right? The Stiggy is seven six overwhelm. Well, if they are forced to block Stiggy and you can still get in with five points of damage on other units well Stiggy's still gonna get him for six and that's 11 points of damage so it's still worth attacking even if you're gonna lose your Stiggy there uh, another example is maybe they have the two big units to trade but you know you have deadly or your units are big enough they're, they're gonna trade instead of just you losing your units well then there there's a good chance that you still want to attack to keep their board low and you end up attacking things like that do they have uh, do they have only flyers that you can't block so you might as well attack um, since they're going to attack you anyways uh, you know how many of their units are exhausted how many of their units are readied things like that all come into play do you sniff out a combat trick you know like hey why didn't he attack with this unit like i would have if, if he wasn't going to block he would 100 percent attack with it little things like this um another example recently in a draft i had a combo with storm collar and the deadly dagger so my storm collar was able to have deadly and i could ping a unit every turn well with that on the board i'm pinging something so it's gonna be exhausted but you know you can't race like you can't just leave units on the board because they're going to die. So you might as well swing and at least get in damage until they die. 
you know what i mean so little things like that what the board state is looking like definitely dictates uh you know maybe your opponent has a bunch of big blockers but they're not high attack they're a bunch of zero sevens and one fours where you can attack into and they have to double or triple block to kill one of your units and the rest get in or if, you know they block three two units but the other two get in things like that all can dictate on whether you should be attacking or defending uh the flip side to that is your opponent plays lifesteal units you're like okay i cannot race a lifesteal unit so i have to leave my blockers back so i have i de-incentivize or uh, disincentivize them from attacking and gaining life and maintaining this life total until i am able to get that lifesteal unit off the board or win in combat so they only gain life off of it one time all these factors come into play and really dictate on whether you are once again the theme of this episode the beatdown or the control player uh the flip side to that is hey is your board state stabilized right are you trying for example here's another example where we had aliens uh eileen's elins whatever i i need to hear that word said so i think it's islands island elins eileen's <laughs> anyways i'm gonna leave that in because that's too funny but uh sanctum so it is uh if you if you trigger the onslaught then it is three blue blue for a relic that creates a 2-2 flyer and scouts right but the activate ability costs seven and then you for seven you make a 2-2 flyer plain and simple right well our game plan if we had that was to make it to seven power because we knew that regardless of what our opponent's doing if we stabilize i.e they're not actively killing us then making a 2-2 flyer every turn will put us so far ahead that eventually we'll win the game and so some so for us we looked at the board we're like okay we are still dying so we need to do something active okay something active and then eventually it's like okay i think we stabilized they can no longer profitably attack us so now instead of playing a card i'm just gonna make a tutu um nope i still can't attack i need too many blockers back so we'll just make a tutu okay all right so i can leave these two guys back to block and then i can get in for four in the air and we're still safe okay now it's time for me to start attacking uh things like that uh can allow the control player to take over a game uh that's happened a couple times to me i can't remember specific games but there have been times where uh somebody played a martyr's chains on me where all of a sudden their board state they were playing very defensively and i thought i had stabilized i'm like okay cool i can slowly start picking them off in the air with an unblockable unit and then all of a sudden they dropped martyr's chains all their guys doubled and they then then the following turn they killed one of my guys and then all of a sudden in a matter of two turns they became from the control player to the beat down and i had to get very aggressive because now i was like well i'm just gonna lose to that because i have no answer which leads me into our final uh factor which is what are your outs <clears throat> so much like i mentioned earlier uh, let's go back to that one where your opponent has a voltron like a huge unit just equipped with all kinds of things you have to look and see like can i beat that how can i beat that and you know for example if you can beat it through damage like let's say it's a let's say it's a five six and none of your guys can take out a five six right uh, and they're swinging so you can't block profitably without losing your board you're like well if you have seven power on the, on the board and you can crack back for seven well okay now you can race that you can race that and you can win so that might be your strategy to be be the beat down and force your opponent to stop attacking you um uh, another flip side to that is do you have an answer to what they're doing right so i go back to the example like let's say they have two evasive units two flyers or an unblockable right do you have a way of getting that off the board do you have a removal spell that can kill it whether it's in hand or in your deck and if you don't and they're attacking well now you go back to that racing situation or the flip side let's say you do have the answer right you want to let's say you have a lightning strike for their 3-3 flyer or something like their 3-3 lifesteal flyer right i don't think it exists but let's just say they do right and you have the lightning strike well here you might want to not attack so for one turn you incentivize your opponent well sweet my guy didn't have to stay back on defense so i can attack with it now and that will open up the ability for you to lightning strike their 3-3 flying lifesteal and then you could start attacking again or maybe like i said you have to double block or you do not have a removal spell for a unit so you have to double or triple block or just block with a deadly unit to stop your opponent from attacking uh, things like that uh do you have if let's say they have an unblockable unit with lifesteal right you have no way of interacting you need to draw your um your 
eviscerate to take it out or your streets of flame well if that's the case then you know you have to leave your units back so you have enough blockers to disincentivize your opponent from attacking with everything minus that one guy so you have as long of a clock as possible or maybe make some less than profitable trades so you can draw that removal spell or that big unit that can block something effectively or you know uh, flip side that is keep the pressure on like if your opponent uh, one of the things i did that i mentioned earlier in another aggressive draft i had where my opponent did stabilize right but i knew that they were at a low enough life total that i was willing to sacrifice two units you know one one turn and one the next to get in some extra damage because even though i was trading a unit for let's say four damage it was taking them from nine to five and then at five they weren't going to be able to attack and if they didn't draw you know enough blockers or removal spells i can keep kind of attritioning my board to get in there or i can draw and get them into range where my streets of flames or chars would finish them off and so that is an answer i'm looking for that might not be on board or in my hand but does kill them right and once again if i if my opponent is playing combray they have a bunch of big units i know that my aggressive deck can't get through that board so i have no answers to their board presence right so what are my outs i need to get them low enough in life to where my burn spells can finish them off or i draw my cloud of ash to take all their guys out so i can swing one final alpha strike or a space to kill them off and so i have to be the aggressor i'm not warranted the ability to uh, or the the uh what's the word i'm looking for uh privilege to be on the control side of it you know what i mean uh so things like that come into play uh as well uh the last thing i want to mention which sometimes is a little lucrative in best of one sometimes you can tell sometimes you can't uh, this is primarily in like best of three which we don't have an eternal where you're able to assess or maybe maybe when they do the uh, tournament series the limited tournament series we're able to play best of three there uh you know your opponent has a bomb rare or legendary or win con win condition that you may or may not be able to beat for example let's go back to murder's chains right they have martyrs chains and you just straight up know you have no removal spell in your deck for it right you have zero relicate well now you're on a clock now you know that you have to be the aggressor and kill your opponent before they either a can play or b draw and play i guess uh martyrs chains and so that forces you to be the aggressor the flip side to that is if you know their wing con is a huge a harsh rule or end of story or something like that that wipes the board and then but all their units are mediocre so they're really riding on that that board wipe well you're able to kind of play around that a little bit and not overextend um you know little things like that for example uh you could play around sometimes it's a little hard but you could play around things like uh storm spiral you know that does two damage to everything so that's an option like okay if they have storm spiral like do i lose here you're like maybe i'll hold off on playing the second two two but i'll keep attacking with my other twos so they can they're forced to use it or um, or run out you know a three three instead and be a little less power efficient things like that can really decide things for you like i said it's a little less relevant in best of one because sometimes you just really have to know your opponent's deck um you know there are cards that we all know people are playing like for example okay there you go red you can i think it's safe to assume uh, literally safe to assume that every red deck will have a heretic cannon so when they're at five power you have to look at the board and see what happens if they have a heretic cannon next turn and that will help you make decisions which i feel like sometimes will help you to win the game um you know same thing looking at your opening hand assessing like okay if they have a heretic cannon can i win this and that might dictate no i i can't so i have to make sure i keep all their big units off the board by double blocking etc cetera, etc cetera, things like that or using my removal spells on their units not going to face uh things like that actively using some uh you know combat tricks and things to keep maybe getting less damage but keep their board clean uh, little things like that can essentially make the difference and increase your win percentages bit by bit to uh yeah to get to a really happy state but that is pretty much the gist of it uh, i think i covered quite a bit uh if there's another aspect that i missed that uh you guys want me to mention definitely let me know in the comments so if i revisit this topic i can mention it or do an addendum uh, one less 
uh, I kind of debated about putting in the show notes or not, but I'll mention it, is also what kind of style do you like to play? I think that comes, I hate to mention that because everything I've always heard and read and listened to and feel like the best players are the ones that are able to be flexible. Uh, you know, there's something to be said, like yeah, player XYZ always plays this, you know, aggressive and they're really good at aggressive decks. But, you know, depending on the meta, sometimes even if you are great at an aggressive deck, you might still end up losing a lot if you have bad matchups and things like that. Like, for example, if you're just awesome at Rakano, but everyone is drafting Rakano, like maybe the correct play is to be the Felm player, etc. like that. Um, that's a very broad thing, and that's why I don't really mention it. But yeah, sometimes just knowing what archetype you do best with and if you are that archetype or not could also dictate a little bit on whether you're the beatdown or not, but it's not a big impact. But yeah, guys, that is all I have for who and what is the beatdown or who's the beatdown and who's the control player. I hope you guys got a little something, something out of that. Uh, I know it was another level up moment for me when I started to take that in consideration and realize it because I was that aggro red player that just always attacked. And I was just like, oh, I guess I ran out of time. I lost. Boom. That's the end of it versus like, OK, I can attack. OK, I can attack. OK, I have to wait. Wait. OK, I can attack. Sweet. Now that's enough to burn them out. Uh, things like that so uh yeah i hope you enjoyed it that was that portion of it which moves us on to our final and new uh segment which is what's the play so for this week's what's the play i actually had another one that was a game like a really tight game decision on whether we might have lost or won the game but our opponent conceded and so uh I wasn't verified on whether it was the correct play or not. And it was really quick. I wanted to try to give you guys something with a little more elaborate of a board state to have a couple more lines to play. So I decided to go with this one. It was actually in the same draft. Uh, who knows? If, if you guys want, I might throw in the other one uh, in another podcast just to make it a quick one. But for right now, I'm only doing one what's the play every episode. Once again, like I usually ask you, let me know in the comments below or email me what your guys' opinions of and whether I should continue to do this, do more, do less, etc., etc. Like I said, it's a little harder to do by myself because I don't get the back and forth on the show, but I'll continue to make content for you guys the best way I can. So let me describe the board today. And this is actually the uh, aforementioned draft, believe it or not. Uh, so this is uh, our opponent is on a lesion. They are at six power with seven life. They have a 2 2 Arachdodon, the 2 2 Endurance Monk, a Corrupted Behemoth at 6 4, and then a Lightning Sprite at 1 4. We are at uh, 6 power as well, with an Island's Sanctum in play. We are at 5 life. We have a 3 3 crook Crooked Alley Guide. We have a Saddleback uh, that I believe is no longer Twisted. Sorry, I'm looking at the Twitch rerun. Uh, then we have a uh, Frost Elemental. A, the, then the 2-2 two, two Flying Serpent that we get off of the Sanctum. And then two uh, Flickerlings, the 2-2 two, two Flyers, right? And that's it. We have no cards in hand. Our opponent has two cards in hand. Uh, the way this last turn went is i believe yes okay so the the saddleback emerged we had the saddleback uh buffing the alley guide and it emerged this turn so we swung in with just that because everything was untapped on our opponent's side or uh readied so he swung in for four taking them from 11 to 7 and then we played our two flickerlings we had scouted and left the power on top to give us our sixth power so leave so then we pass the turn and our opponent attacks let me go ahead and say what they attacked okay so they attacked with the both tutus the six four behemoth they did not twist it uh and they're at three power so i believe they just played the uh the frost the lightning sprite so they did not twist the lightning sprite they did not twist the behemoth and they attacked my question to you is how do you block here Take in consideration they have three power. They did not twist either of their units. And we have the potential of lethal next turn maybe. But we also have the potential of dying this turn. So, yeah, what's the play? Cue music.
All right, guys. So here's what we decided to do. I decided that I wanted to offer myself the best chance of winning next turn and giving my opponent as few draws as possible, especially them having the lightning sprite to loot. Uh, sigils away essentially drawing into better cards and us having the or him having the corrupted behemoth also meant that they were going to gain life and we were always at a threat of dying to overwhelm damage so what i decided to do is which did open us up to a combat trick but like going back and forth on stuff as far as like what they could have being a lesion i didn't put them having anything overly aggressive just defensive things like puffing health so I went ahead and because of that, I felt pretty safe to block my two three threes on their two twos. So I put the alley guide on the two two endurance because I really wanted that guy to die. So if they buffed it, I'd be okay losing my alley guide. Put the three three elemental on their two two oct uh, Roctodon because that was a slightly lesser unit than the other the monk the endurance monk so if they wanted to kill my elemental then they would have to keep their better unit or their less than their worst unit and then i just put the serpent and the flickerling on the behemoth this would allow two trample damage or overwhelm damage to come over but once again putting them on a lesion not having anything to buff attack i felt like this was safe rather than triple blocking to lose our one extra unit or one extra flyer at no value plus this would force them to use a trick because it would not it would um they would lose something in the exchange you know they would either lose both their two twos and keep their behemoth or they would lose their behemoth etc etc and this was going to cost us two of our flyers but once again it left us with the most amount of units gave us the most profitable blocks and did force their hand to do something so what ended up happening is it played out the way we expected minus no combat trick so they ended up losing all three of their units we lost two then they followed it up with a belligerent yeti and then twisted it right away to finish off our elemental dealing the one damage so we did lose three units overall but it did cost them four cards to do so um, and it was a good thing that we didn't take more damage because obviously the Yeti, if we had done something to go down to one, the Yeti could have killed us. Um, so I think it was correct to block that way. We ended up drawing an extract. So we took uh, the following turn, we attacked with all three of our units left over. It took them down to one and then the extract finished them off because they ended up blocking our alley guide, the 3-3 three, three, with their 1-4 thinking you know it would give them the highest chance of leaving a unit and drawing another card and having twist so yeah guys that was the what's the play for the week hope you enjoyed it i think there were a couple of different lines to take there so hopefully you found one that worked out for you let me know if you came to the same conclusion i did uh it's good to know that's how we get better but all right guys that's gonna do it that's gonna call it a show so you can find me at Twitter and YouTube at EJ the Podcast. That's right, where I let you guys know whenever I post new videos, as well as when I'm going live. And speak of live, you can catch me live at twitch.tv slash Jedi underscore EJ, where I stream a lot of limited play, some constructed play, and uh, I just finished doing an unboxing of the new Dire Wolf uh, Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. So uh, apparently I did it at the end of my stream and people liked it. So you might see me do that a little more often. I'm definitely going to do it when I get my uh, eternal card game in the mail. So you guys can stay tuned uh, for that. You can follow me on the Discord, which is in the links below. If you are interested in any of the real stuff, real life stuff I do, like cosplay, uh, fire performing, circus performing, and uh, shows and things like that, you can definitely check me out at CaesarLaBear7 on Instagram. And of course, you can mail me personally at ejthepodcast at gmail.com. But all right, guys, that's going to do it this week. I hope you really enjoyed it. Hope you continue to get better at limited and uh, constructive play in general. Once again, I am interested in potentially boosting my Singleton Sundays. So if you guys are interested in doing some uh, Singleton 100 card combat, let me know. Message me. I'd like to make that happen. And until next time, happy gaming. Happy gaming.